Um, hi, my name is Cindy Hodges. I'm a beekeeper in Dunwoody, Georgia, and I have bees in Auburn, Georgia, uh, Milton, Georgia, occasionally in Tennessee. Uh, and I used to manage the bees at the Hyatt Regency, and I retired from that last December due to probably cracking a hip when I was up there, but that's a whole nother story. So I'm happy you guys are here today. Uh, is the screen nice and clear with the lights on for y'all? Everybody okay there? All right, so we're gonna be talking about um, propolis and the importance of it today, and more importantly, how you can encourage propolis collection if you're interested in that. I'm gonna start by saying why, if you're wondering why is Cindy calling this propolis and not propolis, because it depends on what speaker you hear. I contacted my two heroes, although Bob's a hero too now, <laughs> But I contacted Tom Seeley, asked him how he pronounced it, and I contacted Marla Spivak in Minnesota, who is the queen of propolis research in America. And she also pronounces it propolis because it's before the city. So they feel that that's a long O. Now, Kim Flottam is going to make it a short O, but I don't care because I'm stuck with O now. So I'm, I'm really going to keep it that way. But remember, if you're reading a book and you look in the dictionary, it officially is propolis. Move this thing forward. Okay, we're going to start with a little cartoon that Julia Mahood made for me. And basically, it's just the bees thinking propolis is something just to condemn us, really, make, make our life harder for it. But one of the first things to learn about beekeeping, we need to keep our beekeeper busy. Your friend is propolis. Glue everything together and... Uh, See what you can do to give them more time, all three times, just propolize, propolize, propolize. Well, back in the 60s, and, and even in recent years, people have said, I don't want propolis. Propolis is just a pain in the ass. It, it uh, you know, you break your inner cover. Um, frames come apart when you try to lift them out. Uh, it, it increases the cost of beekeeping. Well, it also reduces the cost of health in beekeeping. Honeybees have, I'm jumping off, base right now. Honeybees have a fairly um, uh, low immune system. It's not very mature, it's not very advanced, and therefore they use a lot of things like social immunity, which we're going to get into in one second, um, to help keep the hive, or the col I should say colony or nest, because they're not always in a hive, uh, safer and healthier. So we'll get into that. So we're, today we're going to cover bee uses versus human use, and hu we're going to we're going to uh, focus on the bee use. We're also going to talk about um, <clears throat> the definition of social immunity. We're going to go through resin collection, and actually, propolis is not called anything but resin until the bees collect it and take it back to the colony, where they may add. Um, beeswax to it. They know they do that oftentimes. There may be res, uh, enzymes added to it from their mouths, but honeybees do not eat propolis. So when you see people who put propolis in their sugar syrup, bees don't eat propolis. It's not part of nature with them. They use it as an external um, connection within the colony, so we'll get into that too. So we have a lot to cover. The self-medication part is, I hope, for those of you who've not heard this before, is going to be fascinating. And the more I read about this, the more I wanted to. These are your official definitions. Just propolis, a brownish resin material of waxy. The USDA standards of extracted honey actually grade it based on whether there's propolis in the honey. So you don't need to write any of this down. It'll never be on a... a a test at Young Harris or anything, but I'm just trying to give you a base for before we get talking to introduce it to you. So what is propolis? It varies by source. You've got about 50, and these are very variable. So you've got about 50% resins and vegetable balsam. You've got about 30% beeswax. You can have 10% essential and aromatic oils in there possibly, and I don't know how many of you have collected fresh propolis before, but the smell is, is incredible. And it varies based on what uh, propolis re uh, resin source they use. So it's about 5% pollen, er, it can be, and then 5% various other things, which in a, unfortunately could be heavy metals if, they're base, if they can't find propolis when they need it. So we'll discuss that further. 
um, later on in the talk. Um, it does have different chemical compositions based on whether you are in, in what zone you are. Worldwide, they have identified over 300 constituents so far. And of course, how many researchers are working on breaking down propolis because it's expensive to do that. So I'm sure there are more that they're going to find because those 300 were found by the 90s to give you an idea of how long it's been studied. In Georgia, we primarily have uh, poplar, populus trees. I do not mean tulip poplar. Jimmy called me out on that and so I looked up more about it and it's other type of poplar trees. So I added on this particular um, thing today, Populus is a genus of 25 to 30 species of deciduous flowering plants. So it can be poplars, aspens, cottonwood is a common one, but other things that the bees can collect pollen uh, resin from would be pine, birch, elm, alder, beech, horse chestnut, plants like that. And I'm fascinated with this, so I want you to be too. The female bees, who are obviously your foragers, they are for only one to two percent of the bees in your colony become resin foragers. So very limited quantity. Now they will not only go out to forage, they will go for a specific trees. They prefer female trees, female over male. They prefer um, uh, they don't prefer hybrids, they prefer your natural old line, um, I'll call it heirloom trees, <laughs> to, just to compare notes. And they'll be picky even on one day of the week versus another, but once they start foraging for resin, they, that is all they will do that day. And they will collect it just like they collect pollen, bees will collect pollen, they put it, they put it onto their pollen baskets, corbicula, and, and then they bring it back to the colony. I'm off. I'm off right now, I'm jumping ahead. But they are, it is so gooey, they can't get it off when they get back to the nest. So they have cementing bees who will come to them within the colony and scrape and bite it off of their pollen baskets to then put it in a site that is like a, a holding bin for propolis collection. Some of you may go into your, your, your colony sometime and find a blob on the wall of the colony or up on top of a frame of your bottom box, that sort of thing. That may be their cementing site. So that's what they're, they're holding out for. So they have that, they use it to fill up cracks. Um, they use it to spread around the cells before they lay an egg in it if they're looking for antibacterial qualities. They, look, they use it against, um, I'll show you in pictures, I'll show you in pictures, but they use it in the inside of the tree and they put it, of course your tree is usually wet on the inside if it's a hollow tree. So they line the, out the, the lining with propolis and then they also put extra propolis where they're gonna build wax and attach comb. So it, it's, they really use it for a lot of things. My first interest in propolis happened when I got some bees out of Tennessee before the people moved to marijuana, marijuana making, I guess, in Colorado. But the bees were great I got from them. And I never thought about using an entrance reducer. This is my first several years of beekeeping. And one year I tried to put one in late and couldn't get it in, so I bent over with a flashlight and they'd, made, they'd sealed up the entire open entrance and made little circles for the bees to come and go. So they did their own entrance reducer. So I was real proud of them for that. So we're gonna go back through history. Propolis has been around a lot longer than anybody in this room has been. And it goes back, they have, now this is only where we've got it from writings or actual archeological excavation from tombs. So we know this information is correct. So it goes at least back to 300 BC. Uh, we know they used it to embalm cadavers. Um, the medicinal use by Greek and Roman physicians, Aristotle, uh, Discords, I can't, Discorides, or however you pronounce, father of pharmacy, Pliny, Galen. The Incas used it for an uh, antipyretic, for fevers. Just propolis. And, and in many third world countries right now, they still use it if they have a toothache. They take a piece of propolis and they put it down in the gum line where the toothache is. Do y'all remember, did anybody in here know Cindy B? What, Cindy B was my mentor and, and we used, I used to go on bee removals with her and she made me taste everything, which drove me crazy because I'm not that kind of person. But she made me eat, taste you know, royal jelly and she tried to get me to eat a larva, I wouldn't do it. But she takes, she took propolis for stomach aches. And as you know, she's not a fat woman, she's a very thin woman. So she would, she eat chicken and, and carrots 
while we were on our trips. And if her stomach was acting up, she'd just pop a piece of propolis in and swallow it whole. And she said it was a miracle worker. Uh, it has been used as a wound and oral disinfectant through the Middle Ages. Arab physicians used it all the time. It was listed as a drug in the medical text in London in the 1600s. And of course, most of you, if you know much about propolis or anything about propolis, you probably know that it was, it's used in violins to, for the rosin for the bow. And so it, it's still being used today. And accordion repair. I never have played over the accordion, so I don't know where it is used in that. Um, it's great for antibacterial purposes if you have a, a acne and skin, skin flare-ups, although expect that orange or green spot where you put it. Um, Modern herbalists don't use it as a cure, they use it to help your immune system function better. So that's what the purpose of that is. I'm not going to go through all this, but it works directly, uh, has a direct action on microorganisms as well as indirectly, as I said, stimulating the immune system. And I don't care if you can take pictures of any of these, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, some of the other things they've used it for is, is, is in cancer and, uh, and the, the big importance of it though to get down to making it simple is the antibacterial effects of it are awesome. Antiviral, it works in some cases, it works better on um, what some types of, I think, gram-positive rods more than on gram-negative rods. And it's, in, it's a very strong anti-inflammatory. You do have the potential for allergies because you're, in, you're ingesting a plant. So if you are allergic to something out there, this may not be appropriate to be t imbibing or, or ingesting. Uh, I'll, what we do, my husband has made propolis tincture for years, and as a person who loves alcohol, he makes it with something like Everclear, and I can't drink it, but you don't drink propolis tincture. You use like a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon, and you let it, if you have a sore throat, I will swear by it. You can gargle with it, and I don't care if you spit it out or swallow it, but it numbs your throat, so if nothing else, it makes it more comfortable. It's also got antifungal properties, and the nice thing about propolis is if the bees need it, they have it there. Now, just to skip around while this chart is up, here, this picture is up here, the, the strength and the, anti, the antibacterial and the good properties of propolis does go down over the winter. So the bees have to collect it again the following year. And I would love to tell you they do it all in the spring, but that's not true. They actually do most of their propolis collection after the nectar flow is over. So, so when you see your bees bringing in this shiny substance on their curriculum, uh, curricula uh, that sort of looks wet, it is propolis and you want them to have that because then they're, they're building, they're getting their colony ready and safe and more antibacterial for the fall to, to get ready for another winter. Uh, for years you've been able to buy propolis, I'm not recommending this, on Amazon.com. But know who you get it from because your source of your propolis and how it was uh, derived and whether they're using synthetic chemicals in the colony or whether you're in an area that's got mosquito sprayers or large pesticide use in a farm, you need to judge all that because what goes in that propolis is then going to go into your body or your drink or whatever and, and that is something we need to be concerned about. But it's out there. I bought, it, my daughter bought me, now that I think about it, it may have marijuana in it. <laughs> my daughter bought me a jar of honey out in Denver and gave it to me for Christmas that had propolis added to it. And I only thought, now I'm only thinking that because it costs so much. I'll have to look that up. I'll have to see it. I may have broke, I may be breaking the law, but it doesn't taste good, so I'm not worried about it. Um, all right, so let's go back. S tropical or temperate, what are we in Georgia? Very good. And so tropical down in Brazil, for instance, Brazil has a completely different climate than we do and they have different plants and yet they still, the bees collect from different plants and get almost the same effect. I should say here because the, the propolis effect down there is much stronger than it is here. But they're all enough to be effective. They're all uh, something you need to, you want in your colonies and stuff. So. There's a difference in, in chemical composition, and everybody in here has probably bees from somewhere different. Certain bees 
collect more propolis than others. Understatement of the year. What subspecies or race collects the most propolis? Carniolans. Caucasians, but Carniolans are close behind. That was a good guess. So Caucasians, and Carniolans and Caucasians both developed as a race not too far from each other, but they were separated by one mountain range. So uh, that part's fascinating. Um, so if you want propolis, if, I'm hoping I talk you into wanting propolis bees because they really are, uh, that's, one, that's one other step towards the immune system and towards keeping healthy bees that I think is worth the trouble. I really do. So um, it's a, it is a genetic heritable trait, which is nice. And they are primarily propolis is for antibacterial and antifungal. Now honeybees, oh I never went back to the, I never defined something for you. Social immunity, because that's what this whole talk is going to be word, worded around. How individual behaviors of group members, or bees, uh, effectively reduces parasite and disease transmission at the colony level. So there are lots of ways this happens. For instance, if a sick bee comes home, she'll become altruistic and she'll try to fly off and get out of the hive if possible. If you see a bee in your hive that is sick, it means she can't fly anymore probably. Deformed wing, yeah, they can't fly. They're contagious. Uh, just to bring that up, deformed wing is primarily associated with varroa mites. But if you see one with deformed wing, don't leave them in your colony, take them out. Don't smash them in your gloves and then keep working the colony because now you're spreading the virus just like the bee is. But do try to take them out um, and also check your colony for varroa mites. Uh, but anyway, there, there are lots of things about these studies and a lot of these studies have been done on mice, rabbits, rats, uh, and very little studies very few studies have been done on humans in modern states. But in third world countries, I shouldn't call it that. In other countries like India, there's a lot of research on this. used, And it's used up the nose, it's used intraocular, and this is in humans, uh, to help with things. And I'm fascinated by that because I have bad eyes. I keep thinking the doctors will do it, but they won't ever do it to me. So geographically, it changes. Seasonally it changes, although as I said it's usually when they're not collecting nectar. Um, and the studies have been done in vitro uh, means in a petri dish in the lab and that's important for later when I tell you about varroa mites. Um, it's usually used in studies as raw or a tincture with alcohol or a tincture with water which is what if you're willing to well, if you don't drink, you can still make a tincture with water. And it can be injected, it can be up the nose. So it's, they're using it, and I think the more they learn about it, I bet we end up with medicinal propolis that's sold out by some lab somewhere someday. Um, as I said, I'm asthmatic, so I have to tell you all this. Don't just pop a big blob of propolis in your mouth and swallow it until you've tried something. It's just like honey with people with allergies. You make them start small and make sure they don't react to it. I, to this day, have some honey somewhere in Dunwoody that when I taste that after I extract it, I go into a coughing spasm. It's just my asthma. Um, and I still work through it and then I'm okay. But same thing with, with the propolis. Now, in the research they've done on finding all these propolis samples from around the world, they have found heavy metals uh, in at least one sample that they took. And they, look, they, they went around the country, try, the area where the, they collected it from the bees, trying to figure out where they picked it up. And there was a cement mixing company not too far away, and they were getting it in the ground there. So that's, they brought that home because they couldn't find enough propolis. So they, that's what they added to it. So it, you got to know your bees and know your location very well. Um, the honeybees go on a single source foraging trip each time. So if they go out for propolis, they're going to do propolis pretty much that day. But a lot of them will change the next day. Um, <laughs> Most of the research done on this, you'll see, is from countries like Italy, Turkey, Japan, Brazil, London, and then one tiny little, little thing in Vero Beach, Florida, which just happens to be the retired head of the Honeybee UGA department. So I thought that was interesting. Um, all right, so let's keep moving. Uh, da -da -da -da. 
So most of it is May through November, late summer through autumn. They forage for this usually between 10 and 3. What other number is that similar to? What? Say it again. Mating flights. Mating flights. Mating flights. The drones going to drone congregation areas. Seems like their work day is 10 to 3. Um, although it can be in either direction. I would imagine propolis collection needs to be done in the warmest weather possible in order to get it loose. So that's one thing. Of course, inside the colony, they're going to be, you know, between the high 80s and high 90s in there. So drop, they do droplets on the bark, some of the fruits, vegetated bugs, buds, young leaves. They probe the apex with their antenna, and they've done studies of this by taking metal plates like the side of a box, but they made it metal plates, and they watched them probe whether one plate was shiny and one plate was rough, and so they probed their into there to get into plants the same way. It's amazing what they do. Uh, they scrape it off with their mouth parts or break it off, transfer it on their pollen baskets, take it back, and the cementing bees in the late afternoon are what take it off those pollen baskets for them. I wonder how many bees we may lose to that removal of propolis and weather that's not really hot, but I don't know. Um, they, there's no guarantee that enzymes are added. They haven't gotten that yet. And bees that reiterate, don't eat propolis. That's Marla Spivak's law that I have to tell you. They don't eat propolis. But uh, they do dance to recruit, just like a, a waggle dance. And yet you're only talking about one to two or three percent of the bees in the colony. They only forage in a single day and 33 percent of those same bees will switch to something else to forage for the next day. Because I think this is the most labor, it's, it's difficult to do because of getting it on, getting it off. Trimble dances and waggle dances near cementing sites. So a trimble dance is like they'll, they'll put their legs on another bee and, and, and shake them and, and make everybody vibrate. Uh, and there are videos of that, by the way, on the internet. Is my picture sideways or so straight up? Well, actually, it's the way it is in the opening of a tree. Um, the reason I have this here, there it is, can you see it? They've lined the, the tops of some of these cells with propolis and also where it is cemented to the inside of the log. Um, just for a better antibacterial. Logs are so damp and wet and fungal and the propolis helps them with that. Here's an entrance to a colony. I've got to tell you I stole these from Marla Spivak. I rest my case. Uh, sorry Marla. Um, but I do give her credit for it on everything. Um, as you see this bee on the left has propolis on her pollen baskets and of course look at the, look at the, the entrance. I mean they propolized it all over the place. That's all propolis. It's kind of amazing. And uh, they're probably trying to reduce their entrance for winter slightly. Okay, so here's some of the rules, we, things we learned about it. They make discrete choices even between, between closely related, related species to collect propolis, which we talked about earlier. <coughs> um, there's little season and seasonal change in composition but there's lots of change in geographic composition. Um, the propolis envelope, which was coined a term, to coin, uh, coined a term by uh, Tom Seeley, and uh, it really does enshroud the colony when they're in the wild, in a nest out in the wild. So they also, of course, as you've all seen, I am sure, in Georgia, propolis prisons that keep the small high beetles in. So when you crack your inner cover, all of a sudden you've released the krakens. You've got all these small high beetles running around. Well, that, the propolis effect of that is that it not only captures them, but it also reduces their ability to lay eggs. So propolis is good that way. Also possibility with moths, by the way. Wax moths can contact these same volatile emissions and it reduces their ability to develop and reproduce. Now these are all in, done in the lab. None of, the, none of these studies have been done out in the field. Um, sit, uh, they have, uh, oh, okay, this is where we go back. This is a bit over my head regarding the honeybee's immune system. It's really very immature. Very, it's a matter of fact, it's according to Dr. Delaplane, it's one of the lowest uh, immune systems on the insect scale. 
So propolis is a huge help for them along with diet. Some of the diff additional defenses are used for, for, strong, for uh, protecting your colony, the nest is of course hygienic behavior, grooming, the fever response, how you've all seen the, the Facebook video of the European hornet that gets bald by the honeybees and even though several many honeybees die, so does the European hornet. Um, and uh, resin collection, so that's why this is actually right up there. Now, is it, is it inducible, which would be a scientific thing? And yes, it is in certain cases, which is fascinating. If you induce chalk brood in your colony, which none of us will ever do except for research purposes, uh, the bees actually increase the amount of propolis they collect and contain the chalk brood outbreak. Okay, let's see here. Oh yeah, what I love is, is, and I've only seen this once in one of my colonies, they embed strands of propolis in the cleaned and polished cells, not just the top edges of it, but down in the cell if they think it needs to be really hygienic for the next egg to be laid. Well, this is a rat or a mouse, and it was, in, it was uh, propolized, totally entombed in propolis, because why? The bees, it's too big for the bees to get it out of their colony or their nest. And if it rots, it's going to increase all sorts of bacteria and, and things within, and not to mention the smell, of, in the colony. So the bees entomb it in propolis, and it's not only doesn't decompose, it doesn't smell, and then it stays there until one of us comes and gets it, or, or nature takes its course. In studies, they took a potato, a baking potato, that was getting ready to sprout those things, eyes off of there, <laughs> and they entomb, they entombed a potato in, in propolis as a study, and it, it stayed fresh and didn't de degrade and was just fine. So, so propolis is kind of interesting. I, I hope we get more research on it. Uh, this is just an inner cover and a separate slide, which is a beetle trap. My bees, I used to eat, well, I do use this type of beetle trap, but they propolize the, the where you run, get the beetles to go in is right here. This is from Miller Beekeeping, which is here, by the way. No sales pitch, just mentioning it. Um, and then in here, we have all these, if you see how that goes in line with the frame length. Uh, but when you pop that open, always have your hive tool ready in Georgia so you can smash hive beetles because they're the devil. But anyway. And here's just a you know, screened inner cover. You see that it's got propolis. I keep wanting to do the light on the propolis around the, the edges all the way around. This is primarily wax in the center with a little propolis. And then look at the wax moth I found in, on top of that. So hopefully she's becoming sterile, but I don't know that. All right, so the benefits to bees. How does that work? It needs further research, but we know that contacting it, in other words, uh, messing with it. It has rich smelling volatiles, which I think has to be something incredible for us. Uh, but we know that the bees use it pretty much like going to Home Depot. They use, they take propolis, they seal cracks, they reduce their entrance, they you know, do the cells, everything we've talked about. There's a whole bunch they do with propolis potentially. Social insects, they have an increased risk of disease outbreaks. And of course, think about how many bees are in your hive and how do they relate to each other? They do trophallaxis with each other, you know, all day long. So it's, everything is very contagious with them. And it's obvious because they're so close together. So it, that's what makes them a truly eusocial creature. Um, so their decreased immune system may have reduced the individual mechanism of defense but not the colony level as they all work together with propolis. So there are other honeybees, do they use propolis? Do they, I'm sorry, do they collect resin is what I should say. And Apis dorsata attaches, you know, they're, they're the outside giant bees. They uh, attach it, they use it to attach their comb to the cliff, so to speak. Apis floria, tiny little bee. They, and they do one, one sheet of comb hanging from a branch also. And the, the bees have learned to put a ring around the branch before you get to the comb of, to, of propolis and the ants won't cross it. So that's a good sign. Um, 
Apis serrana, there is nothing in all this work that says they collect propolis, but we feel like we just haven't gotten there yet. Um, but we're, we're going to say no at the moment. So the different races all use some or different amounts of propolis collection. So anybody with honeybees, they've got the potential for propolis and it's just a matter of more. The Caucasians, as I said earlier, are the number one for that and blatantly number one for that. And then Carniolans, I'm only going by the bees I've had, but the Carniolans I've had are nice propolis collectors, but they don't go overboard. And sometimes I like the overboard because I think it's, I think it serves a purpose. Not to mention y'all need genetic diversity as we've learned from um, the previous talk. So here is, this is also um, Marla Spivak's photograph from the inside of a tree that they actually cut down, cut in half so that you could see it. And she did this, I believe, in cahoots with, Ms. with Dr. Seeley. All the dark stuff you see is propolis. So, American Falbrid. Uh, in the lab, in vitro, it uh, increased the growth, it inhibited the growth of Panabacillus larvae. Now, that was good. We were really happy about that. But once you did it outside uh, in extract feeding, it reduced, and extract means that they did put propolis in the extract of sugar water. Uh, it reduced the infected larva, but not enough to eliminate the disease. So chalk brood, we already said, it can be, in, it can be induced to make, make them collect more, pro, more resin. Uh, the Vero Varroa destructor, they did a 10% extract of propolis in vitro and had a hunt in the lab and did a, got a 100% kill in Varroa. Many, uh, it can reduce the number of mature females produced within a single cell, cell which is good. And the 300 different chemicals make it difficult for Varroa mites to become resistant, to, to develop resistance to propolis, which is also good. So there are lots of reasons to like propolis. Um, we don't know about the possible synergistic effects of the different ingredients within the propolis itself, but I think it's gonna be in a good direction if somebody ever does that research. Uh, back to Varroa destructor, it did not, if you, if you put Varroa destructor into a colony, why would anybody do that? It would, they did not see an increase in propolis collection at that point. So, we've gone through some of this, but the bees use it for their nest walls, continually adding, which is why you get overwhelmed with it by August. Um, comb attachment location prior to building comb. Covering the holes and crevices. Presenting uncontrolled, preventing uncontrolled airflow and reducing your entrance opening, which if you don't do it, they may do it for you. Waterproofing the walls against sap and external moisture because there are a lot of fungal diseases we don't want to get in there. And self-medication prophylactically has been proven with chalk brood. Now, I did, I was trying to get my master craftsman beekeeper for uh, at Young Harris one year, or several years, and uh, Long story short, uh, Dr. Delaplane and I discussed it and he said, you like propolis, why don't you do something on propolis? Because he knew Marla Spivak was my hero and so forth. And uh, so what we did, and I actually talked to Marla and Tom about it before I did the program, did the project, and we basically decided some things I did were the same things she did, only she's in Minnesota and I'm in Georgia. So we did the uh, queen excluder uh, pieces of plastic, we cut them down and we lined the inside of boxes with them. And our, tr our whole study was 13 months. And as you can see, we caught, we caught, <laughs> we, we got a lot of propolis collected. Uh, and we did a study on that with the plastic still on and when we take it off. So they did a, they put a fair amount of propolis in there. She also did, their first study up there was they took propolis and made it into propolis tincture. So they diluted it and then they made it into a liquid and they painted the inside of their colonies before they put bees in. And they had access to the chemical assays to find out what the bees uh, immune system was reacting to with each study. So that was a little bonus on that. Is that the, the amount of propolis after 13 months or? That is, uh, yes, because once I, I didn't take the plastic off until it was over. All right, so 
This one we did, Marla didn't do this one. This one is, uh, we did one eighth inch grooves all up and down, all this going laterally all the way around the, the boxes. So this one I love because I'm at this, these be, the, this was from a colony in Decatur. High beetles were terrible there. Well, the bees put, pro, you see how this propolis has ridges on it? They did it because the high beetles had to come out to get to the next hole. And then the bees were waiting for them to grab them. <laughs> so that was, we decided we were raising varroa trap. I mean, uh, high beetle traps there. It was great fun. But I was really proud of that one because nobody else has seen that. Uh, this is roughed up inside. We, we basically had a control which was new from Brushy Mountain, which no longer exists. And we had the, uh, the plastic uh, queen excluders in there. We had the roughed up insides and we had the grooves. So this is the roughed up inside, which was just a wire brush on a wheel done to irritate the inside of the box. And the bees took to it immediately. You've got the corner, you have the corner in here where they you know, filled it in. But all of this, would, you didn't know you had that much rough until the bees filled it in. They want a smooth interior, but they want it smooth with their propolis in there. So roughed up insides are a good thing for you to encourage propolis collection. So um, this is a, a man who wrote, a, wrote books back in the 60s. I've learned absolutely nothing about him. But he said propolis is the bane of the beekeeper's existence. And that truly is the way people have felt until probably the la within the last 10 years. See, the bees I have that, take, that eat propolis, I mean don't eat propolis, that produce propolis and have a lot of it in their colony seem to be my healthiest bees. So more and more is being learned about this. Um, I hope that uh, you all will hopefully take another attitude towards this, that, that propolis could be a positive thing and that we should all encourage it in our colonies. But more importantly, think about it for yourself. There are, there are uses for humans too. So I thank you for coming this morning. Appreciate it. <laughs>